Welcome everyone. My name is Mathieu Roy and I am assistant professor in psychology at McGill and I am going to be the host for this fifth event of our mini science series on the brain. We are located on the downtown campus of McGill's university. We are on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. McGill has long recognized and honored these nations as the traditional stewards of the land and waters that we work on and meet on to exchange and learn from each other. To introduce our speaker on this evening is the mini science series organizer, Ingrid Berger. Dr. Veronique Bobot received her PhD in cognitive neuroscience in 1997 at the University of Arizona under the supervision of Dr. Lynn Nadell, co-author of Nobel laureate Dr. John O'Keefe. Dr. Bobot is an internationally recognized expert in the field of spatial memory and navigation. She made over 150 scientific presentations on memory at national and international conferences and published over 80 scientific articles and one book. Her research has been featured in university textbooks, on television, radio, and in more than 50,000 internet sites that report the potential effects of technology on the brain. She studied spatial memory in healthy individuals from 8 years old to 85 years of age. She also examined spatial memory in relation to various neurological and psychiatric disorders such as mild cognitive impairment, Parkinson's disease, diabetes, attention deficit hyperactivity, and schizophrenia. Dr. Bobot's research uses methods with cutting-edge technology such as virtual reality and neuroimaging in order to stimulate memory and the hippocampus, thereby reducing risks of neurological and psychiatric disorders. Currently, Dr. Bobot holds a full professor position in the Department of Psychiatry at McGill University. The second speaker tonight is Professor Oliver Hart from McGill's Department of Psychology. Oliver Hart presently is appointed assistant professor. His background is in cognitive and behavioral neuroscience, focusing on experimental approaches that allow studying the natural behavior of rats in ethnologically valid tasks. A member of both the Patrick Wild Center and the Simons Initiative for the Developing Brain at the University of Edinburgh, Dr. Hart also collaborates in various projects investigating neurobiological underpinnings of autism spectrum disorders and neurodevelopmental diseases. A significant amount of his work is in collaboration with National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore, India. Together with colleagues from the University of Edinburgh, he oversees the behavioral phenotyping of transgenic rat lines in which high-risk genes for autism spectrum disorder and intellectual disabilities have been mutated. His lab at McGill tries to understand how and why the brain forgets. His research focuses on the following questions. Most long-term memories are forgotten over time, erased by natural forgetting processes built into the brain. What are the neurological processes responsible for this? Why are some memories forgotten but others not? Damage to the hippocampus of the brain usually leads to amnesia and it is hard, sometimes impossible, to form new long-lasting memories. Why is this? How do natural forgetting processes contribute to behavior and cognition? For example, to adaptive behaviors such as memory generalization, memory flexibility, and memory updating. What happens when natural forgetting processes go awry? Could they contribute to the development of neurodevelopmental and neurodegenerative disorders such as autism and Alzheimer's disease? Both professors Bobot and Hart studied with Dr. Lynn Nadell at the University of Arizona. We will start tonight's pre-session with Professor Bobot. The moderated question period will follow, will follow Professor Hart's presentation. All right. So thank you very much for attending and thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure uh, to be able to speak about my work um, with you today. 
So um, I'm going to talk about the brain and um, areas of the brain involved in memory and how this uh, this function is really uh, critical for healthy cognition and how what happens in normal aging and how to avoid risks of uh, dementia. And um, the, the part of the brain that's involved in memory is called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is a part of the brain that changes really rapidly. And these changes when they're coding for new information is called plasticity. So what's brain plasticity? It really refers to change in the capacity of neurons. So, so um, parts of the like single cells in the brain to code for this new information, including changes in synapses. And um, when these changes occur, they will represent the novel uh, information. So are all areas equal? The answer is no. There's some areas of the brain that will change more than others. And like I mentioned briefly, the hippocampus is a part of the brain that involves very high plasticity because it's going to code for events that occur in our lives only once. An episode only happened a single time. For example, what did you do at your last birthday? Um, uh, the last birthday when you turned a certain age only happened once, that day only happened one time. And so you need to be able to encode for uh, the, the event that happened, or it could be, uh, what did you do at the last New Year's Eve? So it, it only happened one time. So to be able to code for that information, you need an area of the, the brain that's going to be highly plastic. And um, the... And uh, okay, so then, then the hippocampus, which is involved in high plasticity is involved, we talked about episodes, but episodes also happen in a place. So we call it spatial memory. So I see a direct link between a spatial memory and episodic memory because the episode will happen in a specific place. So where we were you at New Year's Eve? Um, I was at uh, a certain friend's place, we had a certain dinner, we had discussions, we could have played games, there were certain smells, uh, there were gifts exchanged. So all of these little details are associated first with a place. So uh, it's also known in, uh, in various domains that using spatial memory facilitates uh, acquisition of novel information, it will actually use space to code for novel information. So, for example, they'll use the method of loci, where they're going to associate the things that need to be, for example, if it's going to be a list of words or digits, they're going to associate it with different rooms in, um, in an environment. Uh, it could be like different rooms in a house or uh, a palace, and they call it the memory palace. So an example is if you have to remember the, the word goat, and you imagine a goat on top of the dining room table. So when I said that, maybe many of you imagine or visualize the goat on the dining room table. So when you saw it in your mind's eye that way, it, it helps encode for that. That memory. So using space, the dining room, help code for the novel information, which is the GOAT. So, and of course, using spatial memory will rely on the hippocampus, which is highly plastic. And that's probably why memory athletes are so good at, um, at remembering information when they're using spatial memory. So spatial memory refers to the ability to learn about the spatial layout of an environment, including the relationships between items in a, in a mental map. We're going to make a map of the space in our mind's eye, and that's going to be helpful for us to navigate when uh, we want to go to a specific location, whether it's our workplace, our children's place, or the grocery store, work, or even how to find objects uh, in, in your house. 
And so uh, the hippocampus is actually an area of the brain that is connected to all modalities, all different senses, and it's connected to different areas of the brain, including the frontal cortex, frontal cortex, and all of these regions will um, have this uh, uh, direct connections to the hippocampus. So when when the so when the hippocampus when people use spatial memory and the hippocampus, what we notice in our experiments is that there's going to be more activity that is measured with functional MRI uh, that's measured in the hippocampus. Uh, when people use their spatial memory, they'll have a larger hippocampus. And they're also going to have higher scores on tests that measure global cognition. So by this, I, we mean um, there's a test here called the MOCA, the Mutual Cognitive Assessment, and it's used to assess whether people have a risk, for example, of having dementia. And so what you see in this graph is that the people that have the highest scores, it's scored out of 30. So people have 30 out of 30 have the best spatial memory. And uh, it's also been shown that when people have a larger hippocampus, they have a higher or greater resilience against many neurological and psychiatric illnesses, also higher self-esteem and higher locus of control. So I'm going to get into more details later, but a simple example of that is if people have good memory, they can better remember what they've done that led to good outcomes, what they've done that led to bad outcomes, and then make a choice when in the future they have to make a decision, they'll make a choice based on their memory for uh, increasing the likelihood of a good outcome. And so there's some research that has shown that uh, the volume of the hippocampus actually correlates to self-esteem and to sense of control over people's lives. So people who have a larger hippocampus have higher self-esteem and more sense of control. However, when the hippocampus shrinks, it looks like the rest of the cortex will also shrink later on, and that that's true not for every, uh, that this is true for specifically Alzheimer's disease, um, where the hippocampus and neighboring entorhinal cortex are amongst the first regions of the brain that are affected. And with the progression of the disease, uh, there's gradually thinning of cortex. So in this slide, you could see here on the left what a normal healthy hippocampus would be. Uh, so it would be here outlined in, in red. Um, that would be a, a good size hippocampus. And you can see in red on the right side uh, of a patient that has Alzheimer's disease, it's very, very thin, okay? And then if you look at all of cortex, you can see that there's also a thinning of cortex with the progression of the disease and big holes in the middle of the brain where the ventricles are located. So uh, when the hippocampus is small, it is associated with cognitive deficits and normal aging, but also increased risks of depression, PTSD, schizophrenia, disease, um, and when I say uh, it's a risk, it means that when people are healthy and have a small hippocampus, they're more likely to later on develop uh, these disorders. And it's been shown numerous times that these disorders are associated with a small hippocampus. However, for a long time, we thought that when people have, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder, the fact that it's disruptive of their lives, that they're not encoding novel information, and it's the disease that's causing a small hippocampus. We thought that for decades, but it turns out to be completely wrong. And the small hippocampus was there before the disease. And how could they figure that out? How is it possible to know who is going to get PTSD to know whether they had a small hippocampus before the disease? So it was really hard to do this kind of research. However, there's a team at Harvard that um, what, what they did is they uh, followed um, uh, monozygotic twins. One of them had gone to war and the other one did not. And what they found is that the ones who went to war who had a small hippocampus, they're the ones who had an increased risk of having PTSD. 
And they, lo and behold, they found that the twin who did not go to war also had a small hippocampus. And both twins had a correlation between the volume of the hippocampus and their symptoms of PTSD. So the smaller the hippocampus, the, the greater the symptoms of PTSD. And that was true even in the monozygotic twin that did not go to war. What does that mean? It means that it was a pre-existing condition and it's not the PTSD itself that caused the, um, the, the shrinking of the hippocampus because the monozygotic twin that didn't go to war did not have PTSD, okay? Um, so the, it was very difficult to discover uh, the same kind of links with uh, depression. So what they did for depression is they followed children, adolescents that had a very, very high risk of having depression because they had a member of their family with a severe depression. And they found that the children also had a small hippocampus, even though they were not diagnosed with depression. So it's just having a risk of having de depression due to family history was associated with a small hippocampus. And that suggests that uh, the small hippocampus is a pre-existing factor to the psychiatric illness. And then, you know, the same is true for schizophrenia. They found a small hippocampus in first episode, uh, schizophrenics. And then for Alzheimer's, they followed people for five years, people who had memory problems. And they, they found that the people who will later get a diagnosis are people who five years earlier had a small hippocampus. And then self-esteem we already mentioned. And uh, the hippocampus is also associated with a number of other disorders, but it, it could be then in, in those other cases that um, the disorder caused the small hippocampus. But it's just to say that then it, it becomes a structure that's involved in many different disorders. And here, just to name a few, it's involved even in ADHD, obsessive compulsive disorder, bipolar polar disorders, even epilepsy, type 1 and type 2 diabetes, even heart diseases. So if people have low blood flow because of heart problems, then blood flow is going to have an impact on the whole brain. And the hippocampus is a part of the brain that has this microvasculature. So it'll be very sensitive to changes in blood flow. Um, and then even chemotherapy, traumatic brain injury, and even anoxia will have an impact on the hippocampus. So the hippocampus, generally speaking, is very vulnerable. All right. So then what, what can we do if we want to help the hippocampus, right? Um, if we want to stimulate plasticity in the hippocampus, what, what, what can we do? Um, can anyone guess if you think about it for a few minutes? So, um, so... All right, so I'm just giving a little bit of time and uh, and um, I'm gonna move on. So if some of you thought of using uh, spatial memory, that would be correct. So using spatial memory is a good way to stimulate the hippocampus. Some people would argue any kind of memory, but I'm gonna show you next that there's a area of the brain that competes against the hippocampus that's also involved in memory. So uh, not all types of memory are going to be effective at stimula stimulating the hippocampus. And so <clears throat> the hippocampus is special and it's spatial um, is uh, the message. And the competing structure is called the caudate nucleus. So you can see here um, on the left, uh, an example of the location of the hippocampus here in, in a brain. Whereas on the right, you can see the caudate nucleus and both of these uh, regions actually are involved in memory. And um, the, an example of how the, the caudate nucleus uh, represents memory, it's a part of the brain that will in, be involved in acquisition of long-term information that's highly repeated to the point that it's become automated. So an, an everyday example is if you go uh, from home to work using exactly the same route day after day after day, what's going to happen is that at the beginning, you may orient, look at the street names, pay attention to your bearings. But with time and practice, it's going to be fully automatic to the point that you're not noticing details on your way. 
And uh, you know you're using the autopilot dependent on the caudate nucleus when uh, you find yourself sometimes making a turn to go to work when you weren't planning on going to work. So the autopilot came on. So in summary, the hippocampus is involved in episodic memory, spatial memory. It's uh, used to build mental maps, uh, cognitive maps of the space, whereas the, the uh, caudate nucleus will be involved in, um, in, in uh, habits, the development of habits, autopilot, and what we call stimulus response. So what do we mean by stimulus response? If you go to work in, in this fully automated fashion, it's going to be a series of relationships where you see something in the environment and that will act as a stimulus, like the door. And you know that when you leave your front door, you're going to turn right and the right turn is going to be your response. When you're going to get to the street corner at the light, that, that specific light will be your stimulus. Turn left could be your response. And then you know you might walk a few blocks and you know that you might see a, a building and the white building could be your stimulus and the response at that point could be turn right. And so you could see that with a series of stimulus response associations, you could find your way to any target location if it's repeated uh, often enough. So you can see also that both those strategies depend on different brain structures and they both use landmarks. The difference is that the cognitive map knows the relationship between the different uh, landmarks to the point that you would be able to draw a map of the place, whereas the stimulus response doesn't know the relationship. It doesn't know the distance and the specific relationships between the landmarks. It just knows uh, door, turn right, traffic light, turn left, white building, turn right again. So we ran a number of experiments where we investigated the relationship between these two navigational strategies and uh, the hippocampus and caudate nucleus. And lo and behold, we found that when people have a large hippocampus, they have a small caudate nucleus. And here it's labeled as stridum because the stridum includes the caudate nucleus in humans. Um, and when people uh, don't use uh, spatial memory as much, they have a smaller hippocampus and larger caudic nucleus. So there's this inverse relationship in such a way that when one is large, the other one is smaller. Um, and some people are in the middle are average for both. But it still tells us something. It tells us that some people use more the hippocampus than, than if they use a lot of their, their hippocampus, their, there's going to be an underuse of their caudate nucleus and vice versa. People who use their caudate nucleus a lot will have uh, less use of their hippocampus and it's represented here by volumetric changes. And we've shown numerous times that there's a strict relationship between using spatial memory, fMRI activity, so activity and gray matter. And so we found the same was true in mice. So we replicated this finding a second time. Then we replicated this finding two other times. So four times we showed that there was inverse relationship between gray matter in the hippocampus and the caudate nucleus. So when we found it in humans, and this was young adults and mice, and then later we found it in older adults and in Alzheimer's patients, we thought, okay, this is really important because it means that when we're stimulating our caudate nucleus, there's a cost to the hippocampus. So it means that especially when we're old, we don't want to be stimulating the caudate nucleus because we want to have a healthy hippocampus. In fact, at all ages, but if, it, if there's a natural decrease in gray matter in the hippocampus with age, we certainly don't want to accelerate that and risk Alzheimer's disease. And so I remember mentioning this to neurologists and gerontologists uh, over a decade ago and telling them, you know, we shouldn't be stimulating the caudate nucleus of older adults. It's going to increase Alzheimer's. And for them, it just didn't, didn't make sense. They said, I don't believe you. You should prove it. Um, and back then, it wasn't really so clear that there could be that such a clear relationship between use it and lose it, using a function uh, or not using a function and losing it. 
use it or lose it. Um, and, um, and so it became important to try to identify what are the functions or what are the characteristics associated with the caudate nucleus. And we ran De we run, ran dozens of studies and we showed that the caudate nucleus was in involved in reward seeking behaviors. Um, it was involved in uh, smoking cigarettes, so tobacco use, alcohol, cannabis, even dietary changes. People who use their caudate nucleus eat fewer green vegetables. Uh, they have higher LDL cholesterol. They have poor scores even on a gambling task, and but they do have better working memory. All right, so if we wanted to prove that that overstimulation of the caudic nucleus has a cost for the hippocampus, what would we do? So we wanted to demonstrate this scientifically, and we thought, well, let's use uh, a task that is ethical to use that people normally use. And so what we ended up using is the following uh, action video game. And so what we did is we took non-players and we randomized them into two groups, one group with uh, the action video games and a placebo control that was a platform action, uh, sorry, platform video game. And what we found, and we scanned them before and after, they played in the lab. So we made sure we, we controlled for their gaming activity. And lo and behold, we were able to demonstrate shrinkage of the hippocampus in the action video game group, but only in those who used the caudate nucleus. And it's demonstrated here. So here you see a shrinkage of the hippocampus in those uh, stimulus response learners who use the caudate nucleus. And we also found increased volume in the amygdala, which is not really great because that is also a structure involved in fear and it correlates to also symptoms of uh, PTSD. And that was in young adults. And then in support of these findings, there's another study with Parkinson's disease that showed that stimulation of the areas of the brain that are dysfunctional in Parkinson's will also shrink the hippocampus. And you can see uh, this is uh, 15 months after uh, the implantation of the electrodes in red. You could see there's a, a decrease in volume of the hippocampus compared to the blue, which was before the implantation of the electrodes. So there's definitely scientific evidence that corroborate our hypothesis and our findings that stimulating the caudate nucleus network will shrink the hippocampus. And lo and behold, we found that in Alzheimer's disease, patients with Alzheimer's use their caudate nucleus and have a larger caudate nucleus more than people who, are, who do not have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So in red, you see the volume of the caudate and it's very large in, in Alzheimer's disease, suggesting that the caudate nucleus may play a vital role in Alzheimer's disease. And lo and behold, we found that with age, people use their hippocampus less and less. So this is looking at uh, children, 85% were using their hippocampus with spatial, me measured with spatial memory. Then it goes down to about 50% and goes down to 35% in healthy older adults. So to understand this be better, what we did is we developed an, a task that dissociates spatial and response strategies. And um, what we see over here are two pathways and people have to choose which of the two has a target object. And if they get it wrong, then they have to choose the other pathway. So in this case, the pathway that has the object would be this one. Um, I don't know if everyone could see the mouse. Um, and, um, and then uh, when people reach criterion, we show the bottom panel and people who uh, choose, people have to choose which of the two pathways has uh, the object. And, uh, and can someone text me in the chat bar whether you could see the mouse? I just wanna know. Okay, so we're gonna skip the demonstration if you can't see the mouse. But uh, so I'll just say it. So if people go to the right, you'll see uh, on the top on the top uh, panel, 
uh, it's a little bit to the right of the peak of the mountain, but then in the bottom panel, there's a shift in perspective in such a way that the correct pathway will be a little bit to the right of the peak of the mountain, which is now uh, on the right arm instead of the, the left. Uh, so I'll just say it again, on the top panel, it was the left arm that has the object, and on the bottom panel, it's, on the, it's the right arm, because in both cases, you can see it a little bit like, so I don't know if it's clear, but the point here is to read, to train people to criterion and those who are able to, to see the exact perspective are using spatial memory. Those who just said, I'm going to go left when they're looking at the bottom panel, then they're using stimulus response. And so uh, we tested older adults and we found that lo and behold, people who went to the correct place, had fMRI activity, nice fMRI activity in the hippocampus. And that was true even if they're at risk of Alzheimer's disease with the uh, APOE genotype, that is the one that's the most highly associated with Alzheimer's. So it means that even people who are at risk genetically to get, get Alzheimer's will still show nice fMRI activity in the hippocampus when they're using spatial memory. And then um, on the uh, right panel, we see nice caudic nucleus activity in the people who use stimulus response strategies. And here we see that people who use spatial memory also had normal gray matter in the whole brain, and it was not distinguishable from people who are not at risk of Alzheimer's disease. Um, which we see here on the bottom right. So on the bo bottom right, there's no difference between spatial learners who had the E4, uh, that's the genotype at, that poses a risk for Alzheimer's disease versus the E3. Whereas if you look at the left slide, we see shrinkage in the response learners or more, more to say it uh, the opposite way, more gray matter in spatial learners even in the E4 group. And why this is important is because when there's shrinkage, it's a predictor of who's gonna get diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease later on. So what this slide shows us is that people who use spatial memory have more gray matter in an area of the brain that's vulnerable to Alzheimer's disease where Alzheimer's begins. Here it's the entorinal cortex. This is true also for the hippocampus. So spatial strategies is protective against uh, having a, a uh, atrophy in the hippocampus. So uh, to conclude, um, I'm just gonna show one final experiment that uh, where, we, where we try to stimulate the hippocampus with spatial memory using Vibo life, uh, that's placed in ecologically valid environments. And what it is is using very simple environments, like it's, you can see at the top left, uh, where people will just have to find the white circle in the in the yellow room, so it's such really easy. But then they have to remember where are positions of of rooms in a house, in a museum, uh, in a city, and then it goes like that. The more more and more complicated. And lo and behold, we found that there was an improvement in memory in the experimental group. Uh, we did see a mild effect in the placebo group. So the placebo involved watching TV programs, a documentary specifically, um, but the placebo did not Im improve as much as the experimental, but it's still worth to mention because there are a lot of reports out there showing a placebo effect. And uh, however, the placebo did not, the placebo group did not show growth in the hippocampus, which is contrary to the experimental group. In the experimental group, we see nice growth in the hippocampus, which we see um, on, on the left uh, uh, of the panel of, of uh, slides. And of course, we had very good subjective reports where people felt um, more confident to navigate on their own and to take different paths, etc. And uh, they felt they uh, forget fewer things around the house. And generally speaking, it, it affect their well-being. So in summary, 
Training to use spatial memory or cognitive maps will increase gray matter in the hippocampus, whereas action video games will shrink the hippocampus of response learners, those who, who use uh, the caudate nucleus. And spatial memory users will be uh, protected against neuropsychiatric disorders, such as Alzheimer's disease, even if they have a genetic predisposition, like I showed with the APOE4. Uh, group. And with this, I want to conclude by thanking my collaborators. Uh, these studies are very, very large, involve lots of people. So I have three slides of names here. And, uh, and then the donors, and this is my latest uh, uh, team, the team who did the, all of this research. And thank you for listening. Hello, um, I'm Oliver Hart, and uh, I'm going to um, continue uh, this lecture. Uh, I'm going to focus on how and why the brain forgets, which is in some ways related to Alzheimer's. And uh, I, at the end of my talk, uh, I will try to make a, a link. Um, so uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge uh, the people that work with me on this. So uh, first is uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Virginia Megas Blanco. Um, who uh, is, has been working with me on most of these uh, uh, tasks. We did most of this together. And then I have several collaborations um, uh, with Lynn Adele and uh, several students helped us uh, produce this, uh, these data that I report today. Um, and I would also like to acknowledge our funding partners uh, who finance this research. So what I'm going to talk today about is uh, the following. I will first uh, give you an idea about what we're talking about, the phenomenon, and then I will explain to you uh, what active decay is, what uh, a certain form of forgetting, how that can be controlled, what its functions are, what its dysfunctions could be, and then I will give a brief summary and outlook. So let's start with the phenomenon. We all are familiar with this phenomenon. Uh, most people complain constantly that they forget uh, everything. That's a, a, a pretty big thing. And interestingly, memory research, as we know it, started um, with this uh, famous X forgetting curve. Uh, it was a guy came named uh, Herman Eppinghaus who studied memory, and he taught himself uh, all kinds of uh, lists with nonsense syllables that look like this. And then he just asked himself to recall it. And what he found is this peculiar function. That means that memory is really good shortly after you learn, um, and you learned all these lists to perfection, but then rapidly memory goes away. And um, that's a real big issue. And uh, shortly thereafter, um, someone observed, um, well, actually, what really is puzzling about memory is not that we have memory, but that we lose memory. And um, to this day, it's uh, pretty much unclear whether this curve here represents this loss of memory over time represents some form of glitch. And that is actually what most people still believe it is a glitch and memory shouldn't be like this. Um, or whether it reflects the workings of a built-in dedicated memory process. And I'm going to try to convince you today um, that that's the main reason for forgetting, that actually forgetting is by design, that uh, our brains are designed to forget, and that without that, uh, they wouldn't work in the first place. So uh, it's a long history, therefore. I mean, people worry about memory forever, um, as you can relate to. And so um, uh, the standard explanations that are... Uh, from the 16th century and haven't changed much um, are, well, memories, this, the memory is forgotten here because we have a storage problem or we can't get it out. It's there. It's a retrieval problem. You cannot get to it. That's another option. Or memory is disrupted. I, mean, I make this a little bit bigger because that's what I'm going to talk about. And disruption means, well, it can be somehow broken up or smeared up. Um, and um, that is uh, actually the cause of memory that I will focus on today, because it seems to be that is the major cause or the major reason why we lose memories. It's a disruption of existing memories. So these two forms of uh, forgetting are illustrated here. So we talk about interference uh, when you have learned something and then new stuff comes in, new learning happens, and that somehow overrides the existing memory. And at the end, you have kind of a mushed up old memory and some predominant uh, new memory. So that's an interference. This new one interferes with the old one. And then we have memory decay. And that's a very simple idea. And the idea means that, well, you have a certain memory that's a really good long-term memory, but then over time, this memory kind of fades away and is eventually lost. And um, 
in the history of psychology, um, the second explanation of forgetting was quickly dismissed as something, well, uh, there's no mechanism. We, I mean, nothing just falls apart over time. And so most people uh, focused on studying interference. And, um, but then in the last 10, 15 years, this decay concept came back and it became, came back very strong and it came back in a new form. And the new form basically is called active decay. And active decay is the concept that this loss of memory, this falling apart of memory that was observed over time is the result of a built-in forgetting process that is out there to erase existing memories. In order to understand that process, I will first briefly explain to you how memories are formed. So um, Ramon y Cajal was one of the first to propose that memories are actually kind of sitting or implemented, so to speak, at the connections of neurons. And this connection here, you see hippocampus, the drawing of Cajal, uh, where he shows these neurons here with the long projections. And the synapses are made here. That's where neurons interact. And you can see that here in the graphic, you see that's a neuron and uh, a neuron has an input and an output area. And uh, it makes connections here at the output area with other neurons. Um, this here at the input area, you see another neuron making connections. So if you look at closely at this area where these two neurons connect, there's actually a, a, a place where the one neuron ends and the other one begins. And a lot of uh, learning is modifying this part of the new neuron where the information is supposed to be received. Uh, you make the connection stronger by making this connection better. And how does it work? Well, uh, the standard model looks like this. Memories are formed this way. You have a stimulation at a neuron, and this stimulates a certain form of uh, connector or receptor, we can call it. And actually what it does, it tells this connection here, you have to change. It's this sending a signal to change this connection. That's the first step. And then the connection is changed, and it's usually changed by making it stronger. And stronger means a certain type of connector is inserted. This is, connector allows the information to just transmit better. It makes the connection stronger. And we increase these connectors at the synapse and believe that that is how long-term memories are formed. And then once a long-term memory is formed, it is maintained. So how do you keep it? Well, you keep it by making sure that these connectors you do not go away. So that, the, that makes the connection stronger. And that is actually the standard story of how memories are formed in terms of the connections and the neurons. So what forgetting could be then is actually very simple. Forgetting could be the result of removing these connectors that were added into the synapse to make it stronger. And there is a dedicated uh, removal process that involves all kinds of signal and cascades that is built into the system and that pulls these receptors in. And if you pull them away, which is a natural process that can happen in certain conditions, and you make this connection weaker. And if it's weaker, again, it goes back to baseline how it was before learning. So um, the idea would be, well, we could test this hypothesis that actually there's a proper removal process by just blocking this removal of the receptors. And if you block the removal of the receptor, then you shouldn't see forgetting. So there should be no forgetting over time. And that's the question we asked. Um, and that's uh, how we did it. So we used rats for this. And what we did is we taught the rats the location of two objects in a square box. And then we asked the rat, do you remember where these objects were? And we asked the rats like several you know, distances to the learn, like three days later, seven days later, 10 days later, and so on. And then we measured how good the rats could remember these objects. And we saw that three days after learning, they're pretty good at remembering that. But if you wait longer, after 14 days, they are basically at zero. They do not know anymore where these objects were. And that kind of drops like about a week after learning, it's gone. So what we then did is, well, we thought, okay, let's test our idea that this loss that the rats you have, that forgetting is caused by the active removal of the connectors that they put in during learning that to make the synapses stronger in the brain area where that memory is stored, the hippocampus. And uh, we have a little drug that can do that. And so our idea was, well, we train the rats and then while we wait here during the waiting time and they don't do anything and just sit around the cages, we infuse them into the hippocampus with a drug that drops, uh, that stops these receptors from being removed. And that's what we did. So this 3Y is basically the, 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 the drug that blocks this active removal from, of these receptors. And we trained the rats, infused it uh, for 13 days, and then asked the rat, okay, do you still remember this? And the control group that basically got 
you know, uh, saline water, so to speak, uh, an inactive drug. They, of course, didn't remember anything because after 40 days, rats forget that. But our group, where we blocked the removal of these receptors, that group had very good memory and had exactly the same level of memory, just like after training. So this told us that there's a built-in forgetting process that is sitting in the brain at once all the time, and that is there to erase memories. And it does so by disassembling the connections between neurons in the brain, the neurons, the connections that were made when memories were formed. Um, and that is basically one possible uh, explanation for this forgetting curve that we see here. That is the result of a built-in dedicated forgetting process that is there, that is built into the brain to erase memories over time. So if there is a process involved that we then call the active decay, because it's a, it's a dedicated process as opposed to like some random uh, disappearance of memories, um, the question is what controls the forgetting signal? And so remember what I told you before, when you learn something, there is a signal sent uh, at the synapse that says like, you have to change the connection because I just learned something, make it stronger, right? And uh, the, the receptors or the part of the, of the synapse that sends that change is this class of receptor called an MTA receptor. So we thought, well, that might be the thing that is a, is a remodeling signal. So that remodeling signal could also be involved in forgetting. It's not only involved in learning, but also in forgetting. So basically the same idea, we block this receptor, uh, block this signal from being sent during the, uh, the memory retention interval and thought, well, that also might rescue memory. And lo and behold, when you block these receptors, so you can see that here again, we did exactly the same experiments. We train the rats and, and then wait for 14 days and test them on their memory. And you know that they forget it within 14 days or actually within seven days. But we blocked during this time when it was sitting in the cage, just this plasticity signal, the signal that is there to change the connections, then the animals had still very good memory. And then we thought, oh, actually, if that is the case, then perhaps we can accelerate memory if we make this uh, signal stronger instead of blocking it. So we did the same experiment. We enhanced the signal, the plasticity signal, saying like, you have to change, you have to change, you're blocking it. And as a result of this, these rats forgot rapidly. So instead of like um, keeping the memory, this enhancing the, the, the signal, you have to change something during the retention interval actually made the rats forget faster. You can see that after six days already or seven days, they're at the level that rats uh, normally have after 10 days. Um, so the second conclusion is that this active decay is uh, controlled by the same remodeling system uh, that is there to change the synapses when you learn something. And that is good because that gives the system a way to protect certain memories. It can actually uh, just do that by changing the strength of the remodeling signal. So you could imagine the run of the mill everyday memory, like what you had for breakfast today is not very important. So perhaps that is characterized by having a lot of these change me signals there. So that a lot of receptors that can send that signal change me. Um, while you have a memory that's very important, you could think like, oh, actually, we don't want this to be plastic. We want this to stay as it is. So we remove the signal that can in initiate a change. And so basically, if we have that connection here, it can send a very strong decay signal and this memory will go away. Uh, while you have the, the memory that's important, has a very weak uh, decay signal that can be sent. And so that memory stays along. So that's one way how the brain might control why you keep certain memories and why others are uh, uh, lost because it just adapts the strength of the forgetting signal. Well, and then when we when we found that, we thought like, well, it's kind of interesting uh, to find the dedicated forgetting process in the brain that's highly controlled. So we asked ourselves, what could be the possible functions, the benefits of this process? So we thought like, okay, um, let's look at some classic adaptive behaviors. And there's a proverb here in Arabic. Uh, I unfortunately cannot pronounce uh, this language, but it basically means that the person who was bitten by a snake fears the rope. And that is expressing kind of like a standard behavior we all have that we learn from one instance of an experience and generalize that to all kinds of other instances. And actually the power of, of the brain to be able to do that. So uh, we can generalize our behaviors and rats do that as well. And we have a task for that. So what we do is uh, we train the rat to fear a box. So we put in the box and give it like some two mild foot shocks. So it doesn't like the box. It's kind of like, it finds it very unpleasant. 
And then when we put the rat back uh, in the box here uh, the next day, you can see uh, in, this blue, uh, in this blue box, you see it's kind of afraid of the box, right? So it doesn't like that box. When we put it in a new box the next day, well, it's not afraid of that new box because it's never seen the box. It didn't get shocked in there. So it's like, whatever, it's a good box. I'm not afraid. Um, however, uh, this changes over time. So when you wait for one day, you see that strong discrimination saying, oh, I know what the old box is. I'm not afraid, uh, and I'm only afraid of the new box, not of the old one. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm only afraid of the old box, but not the new one, right? And if the longer you wait, the more this goes away. So that at the end, the rat actually generalizes behavior to all boxes. It's afraid of all boxes. And that's kind of what we also do uh, with our behaviors. So we kind of are able to generalize uh, learned behaviors to new contexts. So we thought, how is this possible? Uh, perhaps it's possible because the rat forgets the details of where the shock has happened. So that actually this entire generalization is driven by forgetting, forgetting of where it happened. Uh, it's a very simple way to generalize behavior. Just remove the context where you learned it, and then it is valid for all kinds of situations. So we tested that. So we did this experiment, and you can see here that we um, train a rat in a box like that, just like I showed you. And then we put the, the rats in the, the same box or a new one. If you do that after one day, they are very much afraid of the old one, but not so much of the new one. And when we wait for 14 days after this training, you can see that both boxes are equally scary to the rats. That's the generalization I just showed you. Um, and then we used that and actually uh, did the following test. We said, okay, forgetting is really important of where you are, right? Uh, then perhaps if we block that forgetting in the hippocampus, uh, we shouldn't see that effect, right? So um, we used our drug that I just showed you that basically prevents the disassembly of the changes that learning and memory introduced into the hippocampus there uh, by blocking the removal of our connectors. And uh, we did that and uh, basically infused it for 13 days, either this or a controlled substance. And then we tested the rats. And the rats that got the controlled substance as showed the normal generalization effect, right? Both boxes are scary for them. But the ones that got where we brought forgetting, they only feared very much the old one and not the new one, right? So they could still very well discriminate. You can see that here, the old one is scary, the new one isn't. So the third conclusion is that this forgetting that is built in is not just something to remove memories because perhaps we have too much. No, it's also there to actually allow us um, uh, to develop adaptive behaviors, to eliminate irrelevant, irrelevant limiting or outdated knowledge. Um, and I want to close with the positive dysfunctions of active decay. So what we have seen in uh, mouse models of Alzheimer's disease, we can see that these animals have accelerated forgetting after they learned something to a criteria in the spatial task. And the question is, why is that the case? So our proposal was um, that well, this could be that perhaps the forgetting process is overactive, this built-in forgetting process. And someone tested that, and they found that when they treat uh, these kind of mice uh, for three weeks with this little drug that blocks forgetting in our experiments, they can see that there's a strong reduction of plaques, which are the, the signs of, or like one of the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And at the same time, these animals uh, have normalized behavior. So if you give them this drug, the, the, uh, the, the, the Alzheimer's uh, uh, deficit in behavior that is in the Alzheimer's mice or mice with, that have Alzheimer's disease goes away. Uh, so that kind of suggests that perhaps there is something to the fact that a dedicated forgetting process could go awry, and that could be part of the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so uh, I, that's the, uh, the last slides. Um, the question is, why do we need decay? Why do we need the process? Well, we could complain about it, but the reason actually is that the brain just encodes too much. It is a promiscuous encoding device. It makes memories constantly. And at the end of the day, uh, it has to deal with a lot of irrelevant memories. And if you basically would continue to do that and add more memories to the system, at the end, uh, without the forgetting system, you would arrive at a completely overloaded memory system where nothing functions anymore. And that basically has been uh, a conclusion very early on in the field of memory research that without forgetting, um, memory wouldn't function in the first place. Um, so I want to recommend to you um, that instead of uh, looking at forgetting as a, as a vice, look at it as a virtue um, uh, and uh, compare that perhaps uh, in this analogy to what happens in Greek afterlife uh, when, you, when you have to enter afterlife in Greek mythology, the assumption is you have to drink from the rivers of uh, Hades and one of the rivers is Lethe. 
at least it makes you forget your former life. And only then when you forget your former life, uh, can you be happy in the afterlife. So um, that was uh, all I wanted to tell you today. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Hart. We do have time for some questions. Um, why is memory in PTSD, so that's post-traumatic stress syndrome, so resistant to being forgotten? Well, from my perspective, uh, when, if I look at this, it is probably because um, the plasticity mechanisms that are normally uh, involved in allowing memory to for, be forgotten are basically downregulated. So it's kind of like this experience that was so strong uh, that kind of uh, affected the balance and signaled the brain that it has an extremely important memory to deal with, and it basically downregulates the ability to modify that memory. Uh, and that uh, so these are resistant to change, but they're also resistant to forgetting. And I think that is, could be driven by the uh, yeah, affecting the plasticity system. And then can one use forgetting to get rid of memories that you don't want to keep? Can you actively do that? Yeah, this is, uh, this is always the issue with these experiments that we do in science, um, in basic science. Um, I, I cannot, uh, the, 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 the methods we use are, at the moment, really hard to implement in humans because uh, the administration of the drug would be systematic. It would be affect everything in the brain. But there are methods based on reconsolidation um, approaches where specific memories can be targeted and their emotional aspect can be weakened. So, for example, if you have a certain um, uh, anxiety disorder or uh, panic or something like that, a phobia, uh, you could use that um, system to. Uh, downregulate the severity of it without losing the memory. Uh, there are methods to that, but there's currently nothing short of a brain leash to get rid of a memory. Thanks. Dr. Bobot, what should I do to keep up my memory? Well, um, all right. So, well, after hearing Dr. Hart, I would say repetition is important. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to so so there's a lot of old research showing that with repetition you actually minimize forgetting um and uh so so re rehearse but um uh if you want to specifically stimulate the the like memory depending on the hippocampus i would say like from a from a day-to-day -day perspective try to recall information that you've seen during your day try to recollect episodes, speak about it with uh, the people in your household. You know, what did you do today? Um, or try to remember what you ate uh, yesterday, the day before, remember events, just keep rehearsing. Uh, if you can practice uh, building spatial maps of your environment, of your bedroom, of your uh, local neighborhood, your house, etc., and then just go more and more complex, just keep practicing uh, when you're navigating in space, try to remember where things are, not always following a GPS, try to use your brain. Uh, so yeah, so just, just use every opportunity that you can to use your brain. I really rely on those location apps on the, um, I really need them. Uh, is this healthy? Is, is that so everybody uses them. Everybody can use technology and uh, it's great that technology is there to help us. I would say that try to use technology so that um, it depends on you. You don't depend on it. So in other words, um, use the map uh, before, you, before you navigate, before you go out. Look at the overhead map memorize the steps, look at the routes, like wh which streets is the suggested route and try to memorize it so that you're actually active when you're navigating, not passive following instructions. Because if you follow the instructions, you get into a stimulus response mode where, oh, she said, turn right. Okay, turn right. She said, turn left. Okay, turn left, right? So then it puts you in a very passive stimulus response mode, which is not very healthy for your hippocampus, as opposed to if you're active, actively looking at details, actively trying to learn, trying to remember where you were. Oh yeah, this is how I have to get back. You know, try to turn it off on your way back. You know, use your memory. Sometimes we don't know. 
where we have to go and just take a wild guess, give yourself time to take a wrong turn. It's actually okay. I even have a study showing that the number of errors correlate with activity in the hippocampus. So the, the reason, maybe I don't know if it's similar to what Dr. Hart was presenting, but um, the idea is that when it's fully learned and automated, you don't need the hippocampus anymore. So when uh, there's a, something unexpected, boof, you have to now pay attention, right? So when you're making errors, it, it re-stimulates uh, your orientation system so that, you know, in the old days, you don't get eaten by the bear. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, so um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hart and Dr. Bobot, for these uh, very interesting presentations. Uh, I would now like to thank the speakers officially with a gift. Uh, so we're going to send you a couple of little gifts. So you are going to receive a postcard from the Red Path Museum. It is a stereoscopic postcard. So when you open it up and look through it, uh, you will get to see this uh, dinosaur in uh, 3D. So you will receive <laughs> these through your uh, mailboxes. Um, so the Red Path Museum is Canada's oldest museum. It is located at McGill. Uh, it was opened in 1882 uh, and it used to be open to the public, but uh, unfortunately it is uh, currently closed, uh, but um, they, they, they are still working. And we are sending you uh, also some of the museum's publications, uh, which are accessible at the gift shop. So you have access to uh, the museum's exhibit through uh, the books. So for instance, here, uh, we have all of the minerals that are in the museum's uh, mineral gallery. Um, and the last part of your gift is this mask uh, from the Faculty of Science, uh, Science Outreach Team. Uh, so we hope that every time that you will see this mask, you will remember the mini science presentation that you gave during the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, unless, um, Oliver, you find a way to have us all forget uh, the past <laughs> two years. Um, I'm working on it. <laughs> so um, the Red Pad is uh, also running a fundraising campaign. Uh, the outreach team is currently building discovery boxes where uh, instead of schools uh, coming into the museum, uh, they can send these boxes uh, to the schools, uh, especially in remote and underserved uh, communities. And we would really like to have these boxes full of amazing things for the kids like minerals, fossils, uh, skeletons, bones. Um, so this campaign is running as part of uh, Miguel uh, 24 uh, crowdfunding. It ends on May 12th uh, and all donations are welcome. So uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Hart and uh, uh, Dr. Bobot. Uh, and thank you all for uh, coming tonight. Uh, we'll see you next week, Tuesday. So next week is on a Tuesday, Tuesday, May 3rd, for a presentation on the bilingual brain with uh, Dr. De Bretetone and uh, Gigi Locke. So thank you all for coming. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>